Your Excellency, the Chairman of this occasion, Governor before, how would they fire me? Your Excellency, the Governor of River State, Governor Wiki, Your Excellency, the Deputy Governor of River State, Your Excellency, the Chief George of River State, your Excellency, the Governor, before, 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 and before. <laughs> Governor, Governor Peter Odili and his dear wife, Justice Mary Odili. Julius Vobare and his partner. My Lord Spiritual and other Lords, traditional, judicial, and whatever lords you may be. For my keynote address, respecting the principles of democracy. And before I go into my address, I want to apologize to the chairman of this occasion who complained bitterly now here that he has met me in about 12 places within the last year or so. Now I will be watching out. Whenever I know he's going somewhere, I won't go there. For what I believe will be an exciting conference. And I thank the organizers for inviting me to deliver this key note address at this critical time in our nation's political history. It has been a while since academics, politicians, policymakers, and professionals from all over the world came together to discuss Nigeria the way we are doing at this conference. Let me especially commend the Governor of River State, Governor Wiki, for putting his weight behind this intellectual excursion and for his Courage. And courage is one of the things that I believe is essential for the survival of democracy and for democracy to thrive. We sure need more opportunities to interrogate and understand our past and present to design and plan our future. As you all know, a nation that does not engage in conversation, self-analysis, 
even self-criticism and regular economic It is probable best to state right from the beginning that no two democracies are exactly alike. Democratic practice and institutions are shaped by the specificity of history, social, political struggles, culture, nature of production and exchange, orientation, social balances, and the character of the government and the ruling elite. However, citizens turn out to be beneficiaries or victims depending on the cause of the, progress, or the process and practice of democracy. Of course, the world is increasingly complex, information and technology driven, and governance is now almost completely open. It is true that a governing and ruling elite that is not firmly anchored in production will not have the urge to invest in research and development, science and technology, and good governance. And such an elite will not have much interest in dominating the local market, penetrating foreign markets to promote accumulation for development and growth. An elite of commission agents, politicians, appointment hunters, and influence peddlers is unlikely to appreciate the value of democracy and democratization. Therefore, in this our brief conversation today, my goal is to redirect our minds to where we mean the boss. If we are patient, humble, reflective, and willing, another boss is just around the corner. Are we ready to be active passengers? Our democracy has gone through twists, dives, since political independence, and we are all living witnesses to us and failures. Of our history has been the sustenance of democracy since the transfer of power to an elected government in 1999. There is reason to appreciate this part of our history because with us far kept, we have thus far kept the military out of the full and formal control and domination of political power. However, there may be reasons to doubt how much lessons the leaders and followers have drawn from our past and how they are willing to go to democracy and democratic practice. In addition, it is not enough to keep recycling activities and debates around liberal democracy, but we must, as a people, be prepared to move from democracy to democratization. That is a political and social process that is defined, driven, absorbed, and monitored by the people in their various communities and constituencies in the larger interests of the nation. It is such a process that gives us the confidence that we are building a credible and sustainable foundation for the future for everyone. Admit it or not, is an expert in Nigerian politics. 
we all have opinions and we have prescriptions for all the problems of Nigeria. Yet, the country is not making progress. Most of us are experts in what we know little or nothing about and ignoramus in what is our duty and responsibility. We have tried all sorts of regimes, ideologies, planning strategies, and personalities in power. The so-called new breed did not show that they were different. Equally, states run by professors, retired military officers, and substantial improvement. True, there have been some outstanding leaders at various levels of power, but no tree has ever made the forest. The good ones are few and far in between and did not form critical mass. The lack of conversations across fault lines and primordial productivities mean that our leaders are unable to share ideas and have durable and sustained policies for long enough time. This prevents useful cooperation, collaboration, stability, and sustainability. It means that whatever best practice, uh, practices are in one location remain there and may die there. If after six decades of political independence, our leaders are not showing clear capacities to provide a transformative leadership that unites Nigerians and contains ethnic, religious, regional, and clannish, selfish, even class pro proclivities, then there is a problem. In fact, it is possible to declare that the ways in which we have practiced our democracy have deepened contradictions, negative coalitions, distrust, disloyalty, and unpatriotic tendencies within and between communities and constituencies all over the country. Again, this means that there is a deep structural and philosophical problem that we must deal with. We have tended so far to pursue the symptoms of the contradiction focus on the causes and the disease remains stubbornly endemic. Unless we generate the courage and commitment to change course and do things better and differently, we may be heading for more trouble ahead. I raise these issues because democracy, when properly is in the interest of peace, inclusion, national growth, development, security, and stability, is supposed to address national problems, no matter how complex. In fact, democracy, I almost said, true democracy, promotes patriotism and nationalism, builds confidence in leaders and government, and encourages citizenry to reach the highest points of their creative and productive abilities. Democracy encourages citizens to explore the good in their nation and exploit such good and opportunities for individual, family, community, and national progress. Democracy attracts global respect and support and gives a nation at least in an increasingly complex and competitive global division of labor and power. I do not need to remind you 
all that democracy attracts that democracy attracts like tourism, visitors and other foreign exchange earning opportunities. But there must be consistency, sustenance, stability and predictability. Democracy is not a one day wonder. Continuity and predictability of policies must be ensured and not necessarily of regime. Of course, some undemocratic and grossly dictatorial governments also can be attract can attract and enclave growth, usually without development. Such regimes that breed opposition and suspicion never last and they usually squander scarce resources on security and the containment of opposition. We can therefore draw some conclusion that among other factors and forces, democracy remains the best form of government that creates the necessary environment for holistic and sustainable progress almost in all areas of human endeavor, particularly in a pluralistic society like our own. However, if the practice of democracy is superficial and opportunistic, and it is designed to pursue a struggle of limited objectives, it will precipitate variants of fractured engagements that cannot address structural and philosophical contradictions and challenges. In fact, the order of the day will be community against community, religion against religion, leader against leader. Ordinary citizens are then dragged into the directional, directionless, meaningless, and opportunistic personal or narrow ambitions of leaders. The end result will be confusion, diffusion, dis distract integration. Conversation um, and easily settle on the verge of comedy. Political campaigns are taken over by insults, lies, self and selfish interest and diversions not on issues of national interest and progress. Party platforms are developed, launched with fanfare and promptly discarded. Critical issues are discarded as intellectuals and technocrats are sidelined while minions, gatekeepers, and job, hand, uh, job hunters take over the campaign and build iron rings around the candidates at all levels. Candidates are caged and milked opportunistically. At the end, people get elected. They never believe in or share the common platform, fail to carry Nigerians along, lack a deep understanding of the trends and tendencies in the social and economic system. They are foreign to foreign affairs. Again, I will be the first to say there are exceptions to this scenario. What we seek is for all persons and constituencies to be collectively involved in the same process of deploying democratic tenets to guide competition for and deployment of political power. We must pull the best foot forward. Politics is not a dirty game. The rules and principles are all there and known to most actors. It provides the foundation that guide political activities. Democracy 
equally enable political actors to engage each other within set rules. But when actors confuse the beginning with the end or adopt the infamous Machiavellian dictum that the end justifies the means, they get set for a race without boundaries, with no rules or where anything goes. The norms of politics and political competition get imprisoned as the actors invent new engagement as they go along and seek to undo one another in non-beneficial issues to the ordinary person, an ordinary citizen. We fail to understand that democracy is not a one-shot game. It is evolutionary, and it takes time to ground the practice. It is not for quick change, and indeed, if we play by the rules, we will all realize that regimes or governments can change, but the tenants remain constant. They believe by some that revolution is preferred. We will not be so bitter with the election result or overload the courts with litigations, very many of which are like trial lock. When we learn to play by the rules and respect the principles of democracy, we recognize that ascension to office does not empower incumbents to destroy all policies and programs initiated by their predecessors. Rather, a new leader is expected to contribute to a high level of continuity of policies. The stability that a free and fair election process brings should encourage elected officials to take off quickly and produce results. In this case, it readily does not matter. It really does not matter the party your predecessor belonged to. The policies and projects are in the interest of the people. Party is only a platform to achieve the best for the people by those who have got the mandate of the people. Our failure on several, if not on all fronts, is because we are impatient with democracy and democratic practice. That impatience takes an element of greed, selfishness, and lack of patriotism with it. Yet, if you look at our pre-colonial history, we find countries who are genuinely democratic, including checks and balances to prevent dictatorship and bad governance in whatever form. When a new king or queen is installed, he or she does not proceed to behave as if the community is new. He or she does not immediately proceed to build a new palace and destroy the legacies of the predecessors. Rather, the, fo the focus is to correct past errors, build on inherited legacies, cultivate support from all quarters, enhance inclusion and respect existing government and leadership structure and institution. In each new government behaves as if Nigeria is a newly found country. In fact, some leaders sound as if they plan to reinvent Nigeria and create new Nigerians overnight. And you will hear them 
for the first time ever, as if Nigeria had never been there before them. That is because they miss the aspect of democracy that emphasizes continuity, stability, and predictability. One regime can lay the foundation, but it requires many regimes to continue to build positively and constructively on the foundation. It is largely because we somehow we do not appreciate the damage that we do individually and collectively to the fabric of the nation. The sort of anger and bitterness we express while talking among about fellow Nigerians. Our willingness to throw out the baby and the bathwater. The high level of intolerance and preparedness to unleash violence on opponents give cause for concern. I marvel at the level of arrogance, of incompetence, and ignorance. The impunity is sickening. I believe in practice. We must take some time for introspection and ask if we have been doing the right thing to ourselves and to future generations. And in reality, it is not rocket science to get back on the path of democracy and social justice. It begins with self-commitment, then leadership commitment. There are thousands of persons with integrity all over the country and in the diaspora. Leaders need to identify and connect these persons with their communities and organization to national movement and commitment. Once we commit to opening up democratic spaces, sanctioning breaches, and emphasizing transparency and accountability at all levels, Nigeria will begin the cultivation of a new democratic culture that will spread to all nooks and corners of the nation. I do not, by any means, assume that this will be easy. We have made many false starts in the past. We have steadily become impatient with democracy, its principles and practice, as we demand instant results. But past failure should not discourage us from embracing new fiscal perspectives. Let me state very clearly that the principles I've been talking about include, but certainly not limited to building and compacting a truly people-led and people-driven constitution that they will own and defend against political predators of any form. This is the basic foundation that when you involve the people in the process, they understand it, make their inputs, see the document as their own, not only women defend but it will also assignments and realignments. Their welfare and well-being is involved and they can make meaningful contributions. The extent to which we buy into the popular compact of democratic constitution and use the process to strengthen the independence of the judiciary and the electoral umpire, encourage the popular teaching of the Constitution to promote a culture of constitutionalism, promote and guarantee basic rights, 
the easier it will be for Nigeria to engage the challenges that negate national growth and development. Money cannot buy patriotism, but it can build institutions, interactions, and promote brand of development that commits the people to the nation and its leadership. This will be followed by one, citizen participation in rule-based political competition, how much internal democracy do the parties have? Are the parties used to identify and train new leaders? Are there philosophical differences that promote true choice for the people? Do all qualified citizens have the opportunity to vote in elections? How much political education are the parties providing for their supporters? Are women treated equally in the political process? Do we provide adequate space and time for the youth in our democratic and political process? Or do we just pay lip service to not too young to run. Is the electoral, uh, electoral umpire well fun, uh, funded and truly independent without bias and favor? Do parties and leaders obey their own constitution? To what extent is the deployment of money regulated and are Sanctions enforced without fear or favor. How reliable and independent is the judiciary? Equality. Two, equality before the law and respect for human rights. The leadership, functioning, funding, and monitoring of security agencies, and even as uh, importantly, the independence of the judiciary are critical. Do rights really matter? And how easy is it for citizens to access justice? Are social economic rights considered important, at least in, the, in national discourses? Three. Tolerance and inclusion. Are there institutions that protect and guarantee the rights of children, women, and minorities? Do we tolerate differences and truly encourage the closure of fault lines? Four, accountability of leadership and public officials. How accountable are the elected and appointed officials? Do we have an open, consistent, and serious battle against corruption? Do the citizens have a What is the level of transparency in governance? Is governance as constituted used to advance individual and collective rights and the enhancement of social justice and five respect for the constitution and the rule of law is the constitution regarded as the grand norm that guides the basic functioning of the legal system? Do political actors truly have regard for the documents? There are enough legal minds 
at this program to throw light on this challenge. And six, the importance of leadership. Leadership are both born of, sorry, leaders are both born and made. For enduring and thriving democracy that will deliver the dividends to the people, there must be systematic and continual development and training for democracy and for good governance. By all means, these do not exhaust the tenets of democracy, but they represent a good starting point. If a nation through these levels, all other tenets will be easy to achieve. Again, I must reiterate that there are no shortcuts, no quick fixes, and no magic wand. Let me conclude this brief address by retreating my main point. Democracy is possible in Nigeria, and we have the capacity to build a culture of democratization. However, we must recognize and accept the fact that it is an evolutionary process with principles. We must also appreciate the fact that it does not mean that all problems will disappear overnight. Rather, with strengthened institutions, a democracy will empower us to effectively and efficiently manage the contradictions and challenges in the system. Without retracing our political steps to the right direction, the current process will either not produce the right leaders or it will leave so many broken blocks on the path to governance and attract resources and energy away from the task of rebuilding Nigeria and consolidating our democratic practice. The result will be democratic quagmire, increased corruption, insecure richest and better connected with little or no record recognition of merits. The implication and cost of such a scenario to our present and future can best, can best be imagined. I pray that God will grant us the wisdom to do what is right for our nation and people at all times and more so now. I believe there are many experts here to discuss the issues I have raised and offer even more profound prescriptions. I truly wish you all a most successful conference and I am looking forward to learning from the outcome of your deliberations. Thank you.